Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Todd Lukowski, the uh, chairman of the El Dorado Libertarian Party. We have uh, David Lee, who is secretary of the Placer County uh, Libertarian Party. And we have a special guest today. We have the exec executive director of uh, Access Sacramento, Gary Martin. Welcome to the show, Gary. It's wonderful to be here. We're not going to put you on the spot on political issues, but we are going to uh, uh, thank you, first of all, for all of the, uh, the opportunity that we've been able to take advantage of for the last, we were talking before the show, 28 years this show has been on the, year, on, on the air, first as Libertarian Conspiracy, and then we decided that didn't sound so good, so we went to Libertarian <laughs> Counterpoint, and it's on the air at uh, www.accesssacramento.org. Uh, we have a Facebook channel, we have uh, a YouTube channel. And uh, of course, you can watch it on the web at uh, at uh, www. Well, uh, on the web, I gave the address there, right. but also on TV, Channel 17 here in Sacramento. Yep. So, tell us a little bit about how uh, cable access works. Well, you know, uh, Access Sacramento is uh, just one of the types of access uh, programming that's available uh, to uh, members of the community. Uh, public access is similar to uh, the other access channels, uh, like educational access, where you can watch classes from Cosumnes River College or from uh, the uh, uh, Sac State. Uh, there's also, of course, government access, where you can watch on Metro 14 uh, the uh, government meetings from the City of Sacramento and uh, the County Board of Supervisors, SMUD meetings. So there's a variety of different access uh, types of programs. And all of that is a part of what uh, we would say is the mandate uh, of service to the community that the cable companies are uh, re you know, regulated to provide. Um, there is a, a cable commission uh, that gives the cable companies permission to dig up the streets to create the right of way. And then uh, they charge back a fee uh, for that right of way purchase. And so all of us uh, get the benefits of having cable television and having it connected by cable to the houses because they pay a fee to dig up the streets. The trade out and the benefit to all of you for 28 years and uh, for us is uh, 30 years in, as Access Sacramento is the ability to provide the voice of the community to allow people to be heard in Sacramento County. Um, not every community has that availability. Uh, it's nice that we have it here in Sacramento. Well, one of the nice things about public access, and I can tell you this from the 28 years of experience, is that there's no censorship. Uh, there's no Mark Zuckerberg saying that, you know, this is not going to be said. There's no uh, uh, NSA that's telling you that this can't be said. No, no censorship at all. We get to say what we want, you know, within the parameters of good taste and so forth. We appreciate that. And we appreciate the fact that it's, uh, I guess, funded essentially by by the dollars that come from the cable subscribers. Okay. Uh, you know, at the bottom of the bill for everybody uh, in Sacramento County who has cable TV, whether it's Comcast or Consolidated Communications or AT&T, the bottom of the bill is something called the franchise fee. It's 5%. And in Sacramento County, that actually yields about $13 million back to the cable commission. And uh, as you might suspect, when you get a bunch of politicians who are uh, uh, given, given free money, Right? What do they do with it? They give it back to themselves. And so the cities and the county hire firemen and police officers and do road repair and do sewers and all the things that cities and counties need to do. But within our access world, there's also some money that is set aside to help access Sacramento, the educational channels and the government channel to provide the community voice so that you can be heard uh, on cable TV. Uh, we get the benefit of some of those dollars. And you also raise money, though, so tell us a little bit about that. Yes, we do. Uh, so the, we do some, obviously, uh, you know, earned revenue where we charge membership fees and class fees and those types of things. But one of the nice parts about being on your show today is that here on this Thursday, it is the big day of giving in Northern California. The Big Day of Giving is a uh, community charitable outreach for uh, nearly 600 arts and culture organizations, nonprofits like Access Sacramento, who are gathering dollars in one big day. And uh, as we uh, sit here tonight live with about four hours to midnight, uh, more than six million dollars has been raised for those nearly uh, uh, 600 nonprofits. Uh, people making donations online, and Access Sacramento benefits from that as well. So if I may, I'm going to give the website. Uh, for anybody who's watching live at home tonight, uh, you can go to uh, the website bigdayofgiving.org 
slash Access Sacramento. And when you go there, there's an opportunity to push the button that says Donate Now. And those donations will come directly to uh, Access Sacramento and help us fulfill the mission of free speech, promoting democracy, and allowing uh, you know, those voices that might not otherwise be heard in uh, commercial television to be heard here on Access Sacramento, our channels 17 and 18, or on our radio station, KUBU 96.5 FM. And you, you people can donate, obviously, to Access Sacramento uh, and, and public access programming generally. You bet. Other charities are available as well. Right. If you uh, go to the... California. Unfortunately, uh, we can't make a pitch for the Libertarian Party nationally or statewide because <laughs> we're not allowed to do that. That's fine. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, just spot off every week like we do. Well, you know, one, <laughs> one of the unfortunate parts of being a non-commercial station is that we're not allowed to uh, ask for money for any of the churches or other types of organizations that are uh, on our channels. Mm -hmm. uh, the only person who gets to do that, sort of like KVIE, they get to ask for money for themselves. Right. And so here tonight we can talk a little bit about uh, you know, Access Sacramento and its mission in Sacramento County and we can ask people to make a donation to and benefiting uh, Access Sacramento. Everybody else gets to give information, right? For more information about the Libertarian Party, you go to a website. Sure. And that's as far as you get to go. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we very much appreciate the opportunity over these last 28 years. We appreci appreciate your five years of service, uh, your, as I understand it, your third career. We, we thank you very much for uh, uh, helping us make the, uh, the, uh, the facility available. Thank you. Well, it's our, our, our pleasure uh, to provide this opportunity to all of our members and uh, to you as well uh, as one of the long-standing uh, ongoing programs uh, to have Libertarian Counterpoint on on Thursday nights is uh, a wonderful service to the community and a, and a great um, you know, longevity program for us. So we're glad you're here, and we hope you will continue to come back every week. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll not make you be part of the political discussion. <laughs> it's a pleasure being here. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Uh, speaking of the, uh, the political part of the, uh, of the uh, program, uh, like to uh, get a report from the Libertarian Party State Convention in California State Convention in Long Beach uh, last weekend. There were four uh, speakers that I would, well, four, three speakers and, and one other person that were in attendance. The, the, the other person in attendance who didn't get a speaking slot, I don't think, was Adam Kokesh, but he is a declared candidate for the 2020 nomination for president of the, uh, from the Libertarian Party. Keynote speaker was Tom Campbell. Uh, and uh, the Master of Ceremonies and uh, presence all over the place at the convention was gubernatorial candidate Larry Sharp, New York gubernatorial candidate Larry Sharp, he was there, uh, and uh, the VP presidential candidate from 2016, former governor of Massachusetts, Bill Weld, was there and had a, had a, uh, a couple of opportunities to speak, once uh, at the Saturday night banquet and again at a luncheon meeting on Sunday. So tell us, uh, Tyler, are any of these people, uh, do the, any of them qualify, other than, of course, the announced candidate, as presidential timber for 2020? <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> I think we all know that, that someone like Bill Weld, who uh, has, you know, obviously... Did I mention Tom Campbell? Yes, you did. Okay, good. Uh, so, senator so we got Tom Campbell and Bill Weld, senator, who both have, you know, some political... Con ex congressman. Yeah, so Campbell. we all have, both have some political experience. Uh, but then we also have uh, Adam Kokash and, and uh, Larry Sharp, who are great speakers. Mm -hmm. So it's almost a, the same scenario we had last time, where we had Gary Johnson with, with the experience, and then we had uh, Austin Peterson with the uh, you know the great speaker and, and charisma. So we have two uh, charismatic candidates and two experienced candidates. Interesting uh, concept. Interesting. Well, they are not candidates. Well, po possible, possible candidates. Possible candidate. say. We, have, we have to be very careful. We're they, hoping that they're they have not declared their candidacy, and they may not. We don't know. We're still two years away. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A long time. But the fact that they're showing up at uh, uh, libertarian conventions and agreeing to be a, a keynoter, and in the case of Bill Wells, showing up at a number of state conventions, <laughs> uh, sort of like uh, uh, Democrats and Republicans flocking to Iowa and New Hampshire. <laughs> That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think. I think Bill Well, um, you know, I, I believe he was governor of New Jersey, wasn't no, he? No, uh, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, right. Massachusetts. So he does have executive uh, experience as well. Uh, he's well spoken. He's he's kind of, uh, I think, to the right of the Libertarian Party a little bit. But but I think he 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 was a very popular um, uh, governor of uh, Massachusetts during his time, and uh, he was. 
Uh, I remember seeing uh, MSNBC of all places and uh, who's the gal, their main uh, show? Uh, Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow saying, beware of Bill Well, because she went through his whole history of, of how he became elected um, as a uh, libertarian type uh, Republican at the time. And she was she was actually saying beware of this guy. So because he's a yeah. liberal Democrat, and the, yeah, and we're the competition. Mm -hmm. And there there is some controversy. I think the biggest controversy he had when he was uh, trying to be the VP for Gary Johnson was his stance on uh, gun control, yeah. uh, which he had supposedly had been in favor in some form of regulations. However, went out and publicly declared that he was in favor of the Second Amendment. So there's still what you're saying and what you've done in the past type type deal. Yeah, well, he, uh, to his credit, he said uh, over the weekend, he said that uh, he has received an education by talking to libertarians uh, and that uh, the uh, comments about gun control being that uh, yeah, I'm a hunter and I have a shotgun and a rifle, that's, not, that's really kind of beside the point that the Second Amendment is about uh, the final bulwark against tyranny and he's figured that out. He described an experience where he went to Deadwood, South Dakota and bought a sweatshirt with a picture of Geronimo holding a <laughs> rifle in his hands and the caption said, give up your guns. Below, the government will take care of you. Yeah, uh, yeah, the politician. Which obviously it has. Yeah, yeah, well, I, and I do appreciate uh, that, that he's going, you know, going out of his way to, to say that he is now uh, very pro-gun. One place where he did not make any apologies was uh, in the final weeks of the 2016 campaign, he went on the, the uh, eponymous Rachel Maddow show and said something to the effect that he would vouch for Hillary, per Hillary Clinton as a person. He, he uh, on Sunday morning, said, well, you know, I, I did not endorse her. I just vouched, vouched for her as a person. There's a difference. Most libertarians yeah, what's the difference? It's, it's pretty much the same thing. So there's a whole lot of uh, uh, very uh, uh, staunch uh, right. doctrinaire libertarians who, who and, and you know, true believing libertarians who say, you know, you don't, you don't endorse Hillary Clinton and call yourself a libertarian. So, uh, and he did not, he did not uh, uh, back away from that, from that uh, statement. Right. But, I mean, uh, you know, Gary Johnson and Bill Weld, Received almost four million votes nationwide. Yeah, the highest vote total and, of, of any and, libertarian and guess what? ever. Guess what? There's not four million libertarians registered. No, there's five hundred thousand. There's so, five hundred thousand. Yeah. So, so he did. And and the libertarians have. We're so used to just being a lobbying group. In other words, we're we're just going to be strictly straight down the line libertarian. Well, we're, yeah, not gonna, I mean, we're not going to vary from an, an inch. And so we're not going to we're not going to ever appeal to the other three and a half million voters. Well. 80 million or whatever it takes to win. 80 election. million yeah, voters. Know, whatever the number is. Right. If, but, if, we don't have, uh, if we don't have different degrees of libertarianism, we'll never get very far. For all the Aleppo missteps and all of the, uh, <laughs> the problems that the, the Johnson Weld campaign had, they were able to take that 500,000 or probably less at that time libertarian registration and turn, and, and turn it, in the past it, it had been doubled by people like Ron Paul and, and, mm -hmm. and other high vote getters. They were able to, to to multiply it by what sixteen times uh, uh -huh. or fifteen times. Yeah. So it's it's a huge improvement, and we're seeing at the Libertarian National Committee we're seeing a, a, a surge in an off year, uh -huh. off election year in uh -huh. two thousand eighteen. We're sur seeing a surge in membership uh, at the state level, at the local level, uh, national registrations. We're seeing a, a whole lot more interest in running for. Uh, local, state, and federal offices uh, up to 2,000 or over 2,000 is the goal. We're almost halfway there at the state or at the, at the federal level for state, local, and, and national offices. So they uh, have uh, done a great service to the party uh, in, in moving us into the uh, into the next the next phase. Which who knows what it'll be. Right. Uh, one of the parts of the next phase is people are changing registration from Democrat or Republican to Libertarian. <coughs> And being successful in doing so, and possibly get well in many cases already getting reelected, uh, Laura Ebke is a good case in point. Laura Ebke was elected as a Republican senator in the state senator in Nebraska, and uh, she uh, recently switched in the last year or two switched her registration to Libertarian, and after doing so, passed a regulatory reform bill. And in this case, it would be a tripartisan regulatory reform bill because she got. Uh, a 45 to 1 vote to pass this regulatory reform bill, and that included all the Democrats, all of the Republicans, you know, except for one, 
voting for her bill, it was signed by a governor who was actively, a Republican governor, who was actively supporting a, her, her opponent, her opponent in, in, yeah. the, uh, in the jungle primary coming yeah. up in June. Yeah. So uh, libertarians can not only win, uh, well, we'll see if she can win re-election come June, but they can also be very effective in passing <laughs> legislation that works for the common guy. Because yeah. this regulatory reform bill, what it does is it says that if you're a horse groomer, for instance, you don't have to get a veterinary's license in order to avoid criminal penalties of, of uh, I think it's $35,000 in a four-year prison sentence for not getting licensed as a horse groomer. Mm -hmm. you, can give a, you, can, you can get a massage the horse without facing <laughs> jail and, and horrendous Mandatory fines. training. And so, yeah, and, and if you're a, a convicted felon, you get out of jail, you want to, you know, work at a, at a respectable trade, you can ask the state before you go spend a whole lot of money to get your license you know, training and, and whatnot, mm -hmm. you can ask the state, will I be able to actually pr uh, practice in this trade right. uh, once I, uh, you know, go to the expense of getting the license? Mm -hmm. And you can get an up or down answer before spending right. the money. So if you're convicted of, I don't know, shoplifting and you want to be a horse massager, that they're, they're probably, it's kind of hard to shoplift a horse. So there's probably not a reason <laughs> why you would be able, I mean, I guess there are horse thieves, but that would be, it would be difficult. Yeah. You can go ahead and get, a, a, you know, be licensed in an in honest trade. You don't have to worry about standards like moral turpitude, which is extremely fuzzy and can apply to just about anybody. Right, so right. It's a, I, it's, I think there's a big picture to that in that that Laura Ebke shows what a third party can do once they get into legislature. If you look at every every country in the Western world, you know France, Germany, Australia, Canada, all have representatives from more from three or more parties in their parliament, in their Congress, in their House of Representatives, and, except for the United States. We really don't. We have a couple of independents, and in the state legislature here, we have a libertarian. Um, but the United States works. The, the powers that be work very hard to make sure that it stays a two-party system. And it, guess what? A two-party system is only one up from a one-party system. And we're already seeing what can happen in California and Texas, both ends of the fence, where, where Texas is ruled by the Republicans and Democrats will never have power, uh, at least not in the near future. And California, the Democrats have all the power. But, but, but be that as it may, they will definitely not want a third party person taken away from them. Yeah, and it's mostly structural uh -huh. uh, rules, uh, laws that make it difficult to get ballot uh -huh. access, make it difficult. The top two. Yeah. There's a good example right now. Example. So basically third party, uh, Peace and Freedom, Green Party, uh, Libertarian Party, whichever third party you are, you only get to campaign till June. Because yeah. if you don't get on the ballot, forget about campaigning t to, to November like the other two parties get yeah, to do. You won't be on right? the ballot anyway. Well, you won't be on the ballot anyway, but you, yeah. but but in the before the top two, you would be on the ballot. Exactly. So if you were a third party, which is it's hard enough being a small party and trying to get the word out, but now your time to get the word out is cut back mm -hmm. by procedures. And I think that um, we can see in other countries like Germany or France or, or England, the the value of a third party is that you can get people from, from from one side to get something done or the other side to get something done. You could work with Republicans to get gun control. You could work with um, you could work with Democrats for LGBT rights, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so there's there's a better chance of, of there not being a, just a divide 50-50. And it, it, it reduces the tribalism. Involved. Yeah, it yeah. reduces <laughs> the tribalism. And it's interesting, if you take a look at Gallup, uh, yeah, Gallup did some polling in 2016 on what is the general uh, philo political philosophy of the American public. It turns out that 27% are libertarian, broadly speaking. 20, uh, I guess, I don't put me on, uh, exactly on the numbers, but something like 26% are conservative, 23% are liberal, 15% populist. So we've already got a majority or a plurality, yeah, yeah, more yeah. so more than the other the conservative liberals or, or, or populists uh, uh, standing alone. Right. So, but but no, you know, just a handful, a hundred, you know, a couple hundred people elected across the country as libertarians, most of them in nonpartisan offices. So there's something wrong with the system yes. where the will of the public, the philosophy of the public, the the uh, the predilections of the public is not being represented uh, in our so-called democracy. Right. And uh, the purpose of the Libertarian Party is to change that, is to break through mm -hmm. the institutional barriers. And that's where the, most of the barriers are, they're at the institutional level, mm -hmm. to el actually elect <coughs> the Libertarians and show what Libertarians can do once elected, which Laura Epke is doing in spades. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, we, we need to put aside the, um, 
uh, just the, the let's blame the government, let's blame the two, the um, all the rules and regulations, and and let's uh, go over more of a pragmatic approach and and start winning. Because I think we do have the ability to win, um, and that we're not. Uh, it's a lot of just more of complaining was what's been going on, but we can take advantage of the top two. So one example of having the top two is all you have to do is get 10 of your Republican friends to go run, get 10 of your Democrat friends to go run, uh, and only have one libertarian candidate. And then what ends up happening is while we normally, you get about 3% of the vote there on a, a small election, uh, if you have enough diluted votes on the other end, you can and run a spearhead of a good campaign, you could get top two. If you get top two, it immediately gets rid of the uh, the whole argument of I don't want to throw away my vote and vote libertarian. That's the biggest argument that we have is throwing away the vote. You're not voting throwing away your vote for top two system. So let's take advantage of that. Let's get top two, get second place, and from second place, I think it's almost a clear victory right there because then you could say it's either us or the uh, traditional party we've already done. So if we if we overthrow a Republican, it's either us or a Democrat. If we overthrow a Democrat, it's either us or a Republican. Yeah, there's a huge hunger for a, a third party. If you, if you ask people, do you, would you like to see a third party? People will say yes. But then they become afraid of mm -hmm. Hillary or afraid of Trump in, in the 2016 election, and it's pretty much the same at the local, So let's, let's get rid of the... Level. So it's, it's a, it's a, we have fear-driven driven elections. It's good. Well, I mean, we can we can combat the fear-driven elections, and we need to get rid of the, the libertarian image. A lot of people they they look at the libertarian party and they go, "Oh, well, the, I support the libertarian party, but you guys always lose. You guys are the always guys. You guys are always losing." Well, let's let's get rid of that image and uh, let's control our, our elections. So let, uh, instead of running a bunch of campaigns that that are gonna flop, let's let's focus on a few smaller elections uh, that have a potential to move up. So let's say Northern California has a lot of this, uh, seats, I think, that are very high chance of going libertarian. Uh, we can move up to start, start moving from, let's vet our candidates, let's get some city councilmen and some uh, mayors that are elected in office, and then vet, once they're vetted, we can then move them to a partisan race. And we're starting to see that. In Southern California, we've exactly. got uh, Jeff Hewitt, mayor of Calamisa, elected as, as mayor. He's now running for the uh, Riverside County uh, Board of Supervisors. Has a really well-funded campaign, mm -hmm. uh, good campaign. And very well-staffed, by the way. Well-staffed. Has a really good chance of winning a county board of supervisors seat in one of the larger counties uh, in, in Southern California. So it can be done with a focused effort and with people who are, as you put it, and I, I love the, the pragmatists in the party, the yes. people who are saying, hey, we need to figure out how to make this work, because there's a huge hunger for it. Uh, I, one of the interesting things, and I, I tell this story and I'll tell it again, is during the presidential campaign in 2016, I, I spent a lot of time listening to C-SPAN Washington Journal, that's the uh, call-in show uh, from uh, four, I think at four o'clock in the morning until seven o'clock in the morning, three hour show. They don't screen their calls. So anybody can get on the air on this show. <laughs> no screening. So it's not something like Rush Limbaugh where he screens out only the people that say dittos. It's, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's wide open. And people were calling in and saying, I don't like what's happening in politics today. I don't like the Democrats. I don't like the Republicans. We need something new. I'm going to vote for somebody new. I'm, I haven't made up my mind whether it's going to be Trump or Bernie. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of Bernie, uh, there is a, a Rasmussen poll that says that 46% of Americans favor guaranteed jobs with health insurance, which of course is a Bernie Sanders proposal. He wants to guarantee a job, a government job, for anybody that wants one. What's wrong with that, David? Well, I wonder if it's the same 46% of Americans that don't pay federal income tax. Is, is the military that they're wanting? <laughs> we we well, yeah, you do have a military as a guaranteed job. For yeah, you, I mean, it's uh, young enough. It's interesting, but you know, 46 percent of Americans like free stuff and, and free well, wait jobs. A no, this is not free stuff. This is a job. So yeah. presumably, it's people want to work. Right, right. But it's a job with health insurance. Yeah. Right. So. Um, and and what kind of job is it? I, I mean, think there's I think there's right now plenty of jobs just that not everybody is able to work because well, of yeah the other the other disability or the other thing in the Bernie is it's got to be a, a, a I, don't, I forget what the number is but you know it's got to be a high paying a relatively high paying job more than yeah. minimum wage yeah yeah that's and he wants to pay fifteen dollars an hour to flip a burger so well, I'm, I'm curious uh, curious as, as to how the uh, poll was asked because uh, yeah, I'm sure yeah because I mean that, that could have also influenced it a little bit too. I feel that if you ask me do you want a uh, uh, a guaranteed high-paying job with, with health care? Yes. Why, why, why would I say no to that? Why would, why? But <laughs> if, if you're saying, do you think that the that the, we should, uh, you know, legislate 
a, a way to uh, guarantee that? And do you believe it's possible? No, no, I, I would absolutely say no, that's not possible. Well, well, it's been tried before in, in, in the Soviet Union where everybody was guaranteed a job with health care. It was, that's the way the Soviet Union and was the, set up. And the, and the, and the uh, Russian citizens would say, they pretend to pay us and we pretend to work. <laughs> and that's exactly what happens when, when people don't have the motivation to work or earn something, then that's what happens is people don't work, they end up with lines around the block for uh, just four rolls of toilet paper because they're not producing enough. And, uh, and then the, the, the health care uh, is a bunch of doctors that are underpaid and they don't want to do the best job and they'll well, work and we, too. We have a perfect example of socialist health care in the United States, not to mention in, in Britain where they right. uh, Killed uh, little baby Alfie, but in the United States, uh, veterans are dying by the by the dozens and probably the hundreds because they can't. They're in a line to get treatment, right. Right. and uh, it, you know, socialized medicine has been tried in the United States. It's called the VA. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked for decades, and uh, we're still seeing people that want uh, to uh, make Medicare available for all, despite the fact that Medicare is a huge money losing proposition for the government. And well, and it Medicare loses money on me. It's sure going to lose money on people like you, Tyler. And Medicare is supposed to go out of business before Social Security does yeah, right now. Yeah, as, so. far as, as far as And so um, yeah. I, I, we, we have to get into a more of a free market health insurance plan in the United States. We need to, to have a, a transparency, transparency to uh, health care. Uh, I could go into a, a hamburger place and, and, and see how much a hamburger costs. Like I can get two Whoppers for six bucks or I can go to another hamburger place and, and pay eight bucks for a hamburger and I can make my decision based on cost and quality. And the same thing would be true with, with health care. I, I don't see on the wall how much how much does a cholesterol test well, it's, cost. It's not only that, but you also don't have as many choices as you should because in 35 states, if you want to open a hospital or a clinic or a surgery center, you have to get permission from a licensing agency. Mm -hmm. That licensing agency is controlled, right. uh, de facto at least, by the existing hospitals and clinics right. so and surgery centers. I will say and that. they're going to say, no, we don't want any more competition. We're doing a fine job ourselves. I, Plus, that would you know <laughs> interfere with our ability to charge whatever the hell we want. Even in the US, I never visit the, ho the hospital, uh, even in the most dire situations. A, a rapid health clinic is significantly cheaper and does virtually everything that the hospital can do for you. Uh, and as a diabetic, I, I tend to avoid um, you know, using the Stay away from the hospital. People die there. Yeah. <laughs> That's the show. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint at www.accesssacramento.org, on the web, on YouTube, on Facebook, and uh, at cable channels all over the place. Thank you very much for watching.